Happy Halloween. Welcome to Terror at Collinwood. Before we get to tonight's exciting episode with the amazing Mark Maddox, I want to tell you about a couple of quick things. First, I had a great time at Lindhurst meeting Catherine Lee Scott and Marie Wallace in person. They were just absolutely charming, absolutely delightful. I had a wonderful time and I'm so glad I went. And it was great meeting some podcast listeners there as well, Chris and Diane. It was a pleasure meeting you. And I also had the pleasure of running into the illustrious DJ Schaefer, and it was such a great event. It was also a little sad. Um, Of course, Laura Parker passed away recently. There was certainly a lot of uh, talk about her, as one might expect, but it was all good stuff uh, and all positive, joyful feelings of love and admiration. And I also went over to Lyndhurst and checked out the mansion, and it was really great. Moving on here, I want to thank Paige Bryan for sending me some wonderful Halloween decorations. They are so cool. I want to thank you so much, Paige, for those decorations and your very kind words. And last but not least, I want to thank those who have contributed to the podcast financially at buymeacoffee.com forward slash terror at Collinwood, and I will put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, and that does help defray the costs of web hosting and of the Adobe editing suite, which I pay for monthly. So thank you to those who have contributed. Some of the recent contributors include David, Gay, Scott and Michael, Paige, Lisa, and someone, a mysterious someone. I also received a contribution here through PayPal, which you can also contribute through PayPal, although I will tell you PayPal takes about half of that donation, just so you know. Uh, But thank you to James for donating through PayPal. Buy Me A Coffee takes a much smaller cut uh, of the donation than PayPal does, but it is also an option if you prefer to use PayPal. And if you can't make a financial contribution, I do ask you to please like, subscribe, rate the podcast. If you're listening through one of the podcast apps that allows you to rate the podcast, please do give it a rating if you like the show. Give it a review if you can leave a review. I think Audible allows you to leave reviews. Apple Podcasts does as well. On YouTube, you can like, you can subscribe, leave a comment if you like. And uh, most importantly, spread the word. Spread it like the dream curse. Tell your friends about it. Share it to social media. uh, Or if you're in Dark Shadows groups, share it to the groups. Please do spread the word to people who you think may enjoy the podcast. And now let's get to the show. is fun, but there are spoilers inside. Welcome to Terror at Collinwood. I am your hostess, Penny Dreadful, taking on the form of Danielle. And I am joined by the illustrious Mark Maddox. Mark is a brilliant artist who's won multiple Rondo Hatton Classic Horror Awards for Artist of the Year. He's also the winner of a Pulp Factory Award. Mark is, of course, the artist behind the gorgeous official Dark Shadows lunchbox released by MPI, and he painted the beautiful cover for the book Running Home to Shadows. He's done illustrations for Scream, Factories, Blu-rays, which are gorgeous uh, as well, uh, Doctor Who magazine, Scream magazine, Horror Hound, Little Shop of Horrors magazine, Video Watchdog, Mad Scientist, Undying Monsters magazine, Diabolique magazine, and Bookmarks magazine. He did the cover for Sam Irvin's new The Epic Saga Behind Frankenstein, The True Story. Mark worked on a number of Moonstone comics titles such as Kolshak, The Night Stalker Files, The Heap, The Red Menace, Flint, and more. 
Additionally, he lent his creative talents to such companies as Warner Brothers, MC Toys, Monsterverse, and many more. Welcome to the show, my friend. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We've talked about this for a long time. Yes. Oh, I've been wanting to to ha- get you on on the show for for quite a while now, and I'm so glad. I know we're you're so busy. I mean, you're doing so. Just that list yeah. I just read is just the tip of the iceberg. I know you're doing so many different things. So it's good. It's good. I mean, yeah. it's funny in some ways. At, at uh, you know. Uh, I'll be 62 in December, and yet in some ways I feel more young because of all this cool stuff going on than I've ever felt. And I'm sure you feel the same way with everything you've got going on. It's like, you know, we're like William Shatner. We ain't got time to think about being older. Let's just go, go, go. That's right. That's right. That's right. Hey, when you get to be 700 years old, you know, it's it's like it's it's another year for me. That's all. You're you're, you're like a spring chicken. But you don't look a day over 300. Oh, shucks. What a flatterer. Well, Mark, uh, it was so great to get to to see you at Wonderfest when um uh, back in uh, in June, uh, yeah. and we we got to to hang out this time because the last time I saw you was a few years ago at uh, Monster Bash, oh. and we only briefly got to talk to each other, but we we got to hang out at um at Wonderfest, and I, I had an absolute blast chatting with you in the old dark clubhouse. Right. That was so much fun. Yeah, uh, I mean the the memories of that night are are kind of hazy. <laughs> there was there was some definitely well, some- yeah. A little bit. <laughs> they got hazier as the night went on. Too. Indeed, that was fun. It was. But yeah. No, I loved hearing your story, and you know, you as a little girl, and your uncle, and the love of films, and all that kind of stuff. It was really cool. So yeah, no, we all have that. And for me, it was more like my older brother was sort of my guide to it. He was already buying famous monsters when I was like four and five years old yeah and that was that was the first question i wanted to ask you was like how did you get into all this stuff where you so you were your brother was your your sort of your gateway my mm-hmm. mom my mom was one of those that that liked movies i mean she wasn't a monster movie person even though i did find out later as a little kid she stood in line to see the long line to see frankenstein meets the wolfman when it was new and uh, the Spencer Tracy, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I was like, okay, well, there's, you know, so she, she does not mind monster movies. She just, she prefers Fred and Ginger, but she, <laughs> uh, so she didn't mind them. And my brother was very pro comic book and monster movie. And uh, every once in a while I'd see something that would just have me go, Oh, what's that on TV? Or what's that at the movie theater? Something like, uh, you know, uh, uh, an Irwin Allen television show mm-hmm. or, or uh you know, I saw Star Trek like in 68 uh, in on Armed Forces TV in Germany. And then uh, movies would come on. It's like, what's this Kronos with a giant robot or um, uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth? Now, this was all in Germany where it was black and white TV. The Armed Forces didn't have color TV at the time. Mm-hmm. And then I come back to the United States and I see all this color, color television, color Saturday morning cartoons. And science fiction shows and like I, I told this story so many times stop me if i've told you before but it's my uncle goes hey you want to watch some television and i had had not seen a color tv set on and he goes over and turns the thing on and the, one of the first things after a couple of commercials is a guy being held with a pair of pliers wear, wear, wearing a red jumpsuit and this announcer comes out and goes you will not believe what you see in the land of the giants and i'm like oh my god what is this <laughs> I just lost my mind. And then I found out it was like practically Christmas every day here in the United States, Saturday morning cartoons. I couldn't believe the stuff I was seeing Spider-Man and the fantastic four and the the Herculoids and King Kong cartoon and all that kind of stuff. And uh, Johnny quest, the greatest cartoon. And then, and then seeing, uh, you know, on a traveling across country to our new house in uh, South Dakota, being in a hotel room and my mom sitting there making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for five kids to get on the road. And this guy on the TV sits walking through the woods, I think with a shotgun, if I remember correctly. And this werewolf jumps out and the guy with the shotgun's got fangs. And I'm like, what is this? (laughs) My mom looks, she goes, that's called the soap opera. And I'm like, Oh man, I like soap operas. (laughs) I didn't even know what it meant. And I didn't realize the rest of them were, you know, like I said, people, people laying in hospital beds with cancer or the, the, you know, somebody fooling around with somebody else or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, but dark shadows, man. And it just kept on coming colored color movies, George Powell films, hammer films, uh, then universal monster movies, just all this stuff. And it was just ladled into me. And it was a, it was a truncated learning experience 
of a, about just a few years that kind of formed who I was because it was too much. I mean, you, you kids were probably used to it. It's like even at five years old, you walk by the TV set. It's like, oh, there's this or there's that. And you were kind of used to it. To me, it was like an explosion of monsters and science fiction and everything. So it kind of that's a that's a brief history of why I act the way I do. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love that. All of that stuff. It was just for television wise it's like i love how you describe it as christmas every day because it really was i think the best era for television and just because it was so innovative at that time and new and exciting and different and and colorful and fun and it's just like an escape everything was just such a cool escape like i'm glad you called out the spider-man cartoon like we used to watch that all the time too yeah. uh, i love the, the the music the score for that oh, jazz yeah. score yeah, like, like jazz score Man, it was great. oh it is just really cool how did you first discover you had um artistic skills really like, was it from childhood um i remember i liked i i wasn't a sports guy i remember trying to collect baseball cards and i i, I was like i don't you know and then i actually watched a baseball game and i went this isn't this is not for me <laughs> i don't mind running out and playing and playing kickball in the yard and you know running and jogging or whatever climbing hills i don't mind any of that but organized sports just was never for me and so I had all these baseball cards now because I collected a bunch before I started watching it. I'm like, well, so much for that. And this kid next door, his uncle had handed him a bunch of uh, old comic books. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is cool. And I remember a little bit of it because my brother had had sort of been into him when we lived in Germany. And it was like Jack Kirby comics, especially. Oh, where wow. yeah. I was looking at them and I was like, the thing that was great about him was not only was he a great artist, but he left a trail of breadcrumbs where you could look at it and go, you know what? I think I see how he's doing it. And that's why I think so many Jack Kirby clones start off in the comic book industry and then become themselves. There's a lot of them that are famous that started off just Kirby clones. And mm -hmm. I started off that way. And I did that for, uh, a few years and then my friends and I kind of uh, when I moved to North Carolina I had a couple of buddies that we kind of egged each other on especially during the summer we'd go and sit at the dining room table at any other one of our other's houses with typewriter paper and pen ballpoint pens and pencils and, and draw and sort of look at what the other one was doing and learn off of each other and then one day my parents my 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 mom could see that I could draw, but my dad, when he found out about it, he lost his mind. He thought that was fantastic. He was just like, I, I handed him a picture of Superman that mm -hmm. I had drawn, recopied from a comic book, and he was like crazy about it because, you know, he had lived a hard life. I mean, he was in the military at the time, but he was 13 years old when he had to leave his home and go be in the oil fields in Oklahoma, had to have his own apartment as a kid. And he was excited because wow. he goes, this means you won't have to be just shoveling coal or wow. something so he knew right away that you you he had that was, gift yeah he was he promoted it it wasn't like he was pushy 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 like you know those movies where the piano the mom of the piano kid is like insane or something but it's <laughs> like you know you know what i mean where the kid you know yeah. blood's coming off their fingers while they're playing the <laughs> piano or playing the guitar or whatever but he just every once in a while i get a little nudge nudge from him go, go go over here make sure you take the high school art classes i got a there's a guy uh as soon as i got out of high school i went to a wonderful little botech school here lively botech with a great art teacher and my entire education with him was uh, i think it was less than a thousand bucks for a year and a half six hours a day with this guy and it was like so my dad and everything it just started to build but what happened backing up is i was doing comic books for a while but then i started looking at stuff like portraits of people and especially the old famous Stephen E. Whitfield making of Star Trek book, uh, the real first book that talks about how television gets made. And I, I started drawing Kirk and Spock and all of them out of there. And it took, it took, it jumped from comic book outlines and color fills to reality. And I just kept building on it and building on it, you know, and, uh, but, uh, you know, some good teachers and a lot of, a lot of self teaching and, you know, so, and I, it was the one thing I was good at. It was the one thing, you know, if I have a tr trouble in my life, I'd, I'd even hunker down even harder and try to try to work even harder. You know? Yeah. So, well, yeah. What was the first commercial 
um, the thing that you got, you know, the first piece of artwork that you got paid for that got published? Well, uh, past Star Trek fan club fanzines with our little club here in town. When I actually... Oh, I love that you were doing that. That's cool. Oh, yeah. This is like 75, 76. Yeah. Once again, I wasn't into the sports and all that kind of stuff. And somebody goes, you know, there's yeah. a Star Trek club here in town. I'm like, ooh. Yeah. And I had a bunch of friends, some of them still to this day, you know, here and there that, uh, you know, for all those years. But um, the first thing that I did, you mean like in a, in a, because I did a bunch of other stuff. I mean, I was a corporate art director and I did t-shirts on stuff, but you mean okay. like the first, first genre thing that you and I love. Is yeah, that what yeah. you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Um, the first time it really stuck was uh, Richard Clemenson at Little Shop of Horrors. I sent him, I was doing a few pulp covers for what they call new pulp, kind of in the Doc Savage sort of style. And I'd done a few of them. And then I had my regular portfolio and I sent this stuff to Richard Clemenson and said, hey, I'm a fan of your magazine. And uh, I'd really like to, you know, see about doing some artwork for it. I was just hoping to get a black and white interior piece, you know, just so I could have hang my hat on it. It was like, if I do this, I can die happy. I've got one thing published. I'm, 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 I'm in the world of fandom just for one. <laughs> and then he let me, let me do three interiors and a co color inside front cover for Frankenstein must be destroyed. It was all hammer. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of them was actually night of the big heat with the glowing rocks that kill people, kill Peter Cushing and stuff. But, and him and his wife, liked it so much they said would you like to do the cover of the next issue and i'm like okay if i can do this i can die happy and it's always that yeah get that next thing that you've never done before and it's like okay i can die happy and i'm, I'm still saying that to this day if i can if i can do that i'll die happy you know yeah. so um anyway so that's you know that was the first thing little shop of horrors thank goodness for remember what year that was that wasn't that far back ago i think it was only like 2007 Okay. Something like wow. that. Wow. But I've been doing all this. I, for years, have been paid for, you know, regular commercial artwork. Sure. And I had had some stuff in the Wall Street Journal and Advertising Age. And even on CNN Financial, had shown some of my artwork on demo. Or they were demonstrating web pages. So my, I had, it was that. But And it was satisfying. And I got paid well. But then uh, later, when the 2008 housing bubble burst, I mean, it was like the I, I couldn't get paid the way I used to get paid. And it was like, well, if I'm not going to get paid the way I used to get paid and I'm you know, working for like a half or a third of what I used to get paid, I'm at least going to have fun and do this seriously. Yeah. Uh, and paint the things that you love, uh, paint which things that I love. Yeah. It just shines through. I mean, it's your your I was telling you a messenger the other day, your. I was looking at your uh, Scream Factory Blu-rays, which I have some of them right here, actually. And for those who are listening to the audio version, I recommend jumping over to YouTube so you can see some of the images of Mark's magnificent artwork. But, you know, I mean, just unbelievable. Loved. I love gorgeous. that movie, too. It's oh, Brides of, of Dracula. It's these yeah. movies mean. It isn't, it isn't like some people. You meet some people that do monster artwork. And you meet them, and you're kind of surprised because everyone's like, yeah, it was a job. And I'm like... Oh yeah, that's no, that's no, always no, like sad. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, not a job for me. I take it, I take it very oh, seriously. You can tell. I mean, you can just it just the colors are just like it looks like a hammer movie in, in painted form. It really just gives that that whole vibe to it. Um, and what's what other one do I have here? I, Evil of Frankenstein. Just I love how you paint Cushing too. So what's funny with the amazing. Evil of Frankenstein is that yeah. that one was painted almost 50 years to the month I first saw that film. Really? Wow. And it was my first, it wasn't my first Hammer monster movie. Several mm -hmm. uh, in Germany, I had seen X the Unknown, which I love too. But mm -hmm. it was my first Frankenstein movie with a Frankenstein in it, with a Frankenstein monster, probably just my first Frankenstein movie, period. Oh, so you saw it before the Karloff film then? Yes, I saw the Karloff oh. film, I think within six months of that. They did uh, one wow. night on Creature Feature because mm -hmm. I was in the middle of the country at the time. I, like I said, I was in South Dakota. They had... Uh, Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein on a double bill that oh, night. Nice. I, I wow. saw I saw both of them and I was like just went nuts. Yeah. Frankenstein is you know for is has been my favorite monster. The Karloff version has been my favorite for so long. Although it jumps around a bit, you know, I love Lugosi as Dracula and all that stuff too. But with with that one, I I did it with you know as soon as the movie was over, I sat there with a, a little piece of typing paper and some crayons and I drew that monster. And there's a new issue of little shop of horrors coming out 
where I decided to actually redo the piece that I did back 50 years ago. It was a little kid and it's him, the monster standing in the doorway with that wrought iron bar that he's pulled out of the, oh, out cool. of the gate and yeah. he's stand, he's standing there. And, uh, I just said, you know, I guess scratch that itch, man. I just wish I still had the, I still wish I had the, uh, the the original one I had oh, done in 69. You could post like a little, side by side. <laughs> little kid, a little kid yeah. drawing, you know, like something you'd see on the refrigerator kind of thing. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I want to circle back real quick. Uh, you mentioned the first episode of Dark Shadows that you watched was um, you know, Barnabas with the with the shotgun and the werewolf uh yeah. coming towards him. I remember that he sh- shoots him and it doesn't affect him and then he uses the cane. The cane is because it's silver, a silver wolf side cane. That's what that's right. what repels the werewolf. Um so some I know some Dark Shadows fans kind of they're just all in on Dark Shadows, but they don't kind of see sometimes the overall uh, tapestry of how Dark Shadows fits into the whole world of monster kid culture. And Dark Shadows is a huge uh, part of that. I think it's an important component oh, I think of it's that. Massively important. Yeah. So for when you first discovered it, so it just became part of that entire classic horror world that you were experiencing, horror, sci-fi, fantasy. It, 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 it's its own beast in a way, no pun intended, because <laughs> of the pain I suffered because of that show. Why is it pain? Why so? Pain, because as soon as we moved to South Dakota, I found out that school let out. I ran home and it was ending credits every day. No. Oh no! Where, where you went? You were in the, uh, in the where, where? Where were you? Growing? We were in in, in in Rapid City, South Dakota. Oh, uh, okay. Ells, so Ellsworth was... Air Force Base, and it was the time change. The time change. And I'd yeah. get there, and I'd get home, and you'd. Uh... <laughs> and <laughs> so, and another thing too, and this is a, you did not pay tax on base if you were military. You did mm-hmm. not. As a matter of fact, I think, think if, if I remember correctly, if they had like paid for something for a dollar off base, they actually subtracted like a penny or two off of what you were. No tax mm-hmm. for military. And I remember coming home from off the base from my school and coming in and they had a gold key Dark Shadows comic oh, with Barnabas okay. and it had a poster inside. Uh-huh. Even though I wasn't seeing the show, I still had to have it. I get to read the comic book. They can't take that away from me. I didn't realize it was 35 cents or whatever it was. It was more than what I was normally used to paying, which I think at the time was like 15 cents a comic, maybe 25 if it was a big one. And I went there and with with the money and uh, what I had, and the lady goes, no, no, see the price. And I went, oh, no. Okay, so I went home. Next day, coming back to school with the extra dime, I think it was, to pay for it. Walking by, walked in, got, I think it was 35 cents or whatever. She goes, where's the tax? I said, said, there's tax? What do you mean? (laughs) She goes, we have to charge tax. On base, you guys don't charge tax. We have to charge tax here. And I said, well, how much is it? She goes, a penny. And I said, I don't don't have a penny. I, I, I don't have it on me. And she goes, sorry, you can't sell it if you don't have the tax. Ah. Okay, so I'll go home and I'll get another penny. Went home. Next day, 36 cents come by. It's gone. No. Nope. Ah. So Man, that's a few years ago, I looked for it on uh, Heritage Auctions or something. It's only 100 bucks now. So with the poster, yeah. The, with the yeah, poster. Yeah, with the poster or something. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm, I am doomed never to get that comic. But I got the uh, the coffin box set of episodes, so I can at least get my revenge in that way. Oh, oh wow. You know. Then you, you made out pretty good there. And um, Hermes Press does reprints of, of the comics, uh, although yeah. you won't get the poster if you get the, the reprints, the, the books. Doesn't matter. But... I got the episodes. It's like yeah, if yeah, somebody yeah. told me, don't worry, Mark, <laughs> one day you'll own every episode of the show. I'm like, what does that even mean? What? fantasy world is that you right know, yeah yeah you know 60s. some of the some younger uh for like my students you know like i talked to them about you know pre-vcr days like i was like i used to record uh the monsters and the adams family on uh audio tapes audio, so I could listen, and- <laughs> whenever yeah, i so- li- want to listen to the to those TV shows set microphone yep telling <laughs> yeah. everybody in the house <laughs> yep <laughs> i oh my god i had so many things everybody did that you know there's actually i think there might even be a facebook page for audio recording off of tv what because oh, wow. everybody did star trek everybody did their favorite movies i mm. did a journey to the center of the earth the bionic <laughs> people star trek or when i mean i did all that stuff i mean <laughs> i had the entire omega man i had that on reel to reel 
<laughs> wow. But, I mean, it was like it was we couldn't get the picture, but it was better than not having anything at all. You know, exactly. Yeah, it was that that was the only option. Like, and then it was it was great because you could listen to it anytime you, you wanted. So um, sure. and that's that's that was actually how I got to hear some of the um, in Dark Shadows when it went into syndication that last year of the show was not. The stations weren't paying for that because it was really expensive. I guess World World Vision, the syndicator, was charging a lot of money for that last year. So um, yeah. some fans had recorded it originally when it aired those those episodes. So there were some like on the gray market or whatever in the fanzines that you could send away and get some of the audio yeah, tapes. I, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, there's sometimes I I I don't necessarily agree with the black market or the gray market and all that kind of stuff, but there are certain people that refuse to put out old monster movies and stuff like that it, the only right. way to see it is bootleg and it's oh, like yeah is it right no like for I'm... years the island of lost souls like you could not it, it wasn't released on um you know dvd or anything sure. uh so i mean i remember this was pre before they did officially release it like it yeah. was tough to get it so you would have to find somebody at a con or something that had a had all those it. ones like with saucer men uh, invasion of the saucer men and, mm -hmm. and some of those other ones that they they just won't release mm -hmm. uh and you know i mean it's it's not that i'm promoting theft but it's like you get somebody desperate enough to see something it's like we're like crack addicts if there's something we really <laughs> you know, really need to see you know i gotta right. watch this movie yeah, yeah exactly but, yeah you know, so, so when you're, I was, I have a question. We were talking a little bit before we started recording. Your likenesses are just so incredibly spot on. I mean, you really capture it. But you, you, we were talking about like acrylics versus oils and digital. Like, can you talk about your process and what you prefer to use when you're painting? Well, uh, in a perfect world, I prefer to just use oils all the time. But and I have used oils years ago. But then, for most of my covers that you see published and stuff not all of them but most of them are done digital just because of the time crunch that i'm in and especially I, I i'm one of those people that can't stand when you physically painted something and then they want changes oh yeah i'm not, yeah. I'm not easy with that so it's like we'll make it to where it's editable right then and there mm -hmm. so a lot of stuff is digital but i uh have done several covers in acrylics and I, I I handle it like oils in a way, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, a lot of cross hatching, and then I I do uh, the rim I do the glazing. When I find that something isn't exactly the right shade or color, or warmth or cold that I want or whatever, I'll put a glazing over it. The way uh, I don't know if you know who Maxfield Parrish is, the the, the painter, but he's a, but people like that or or Hannes Bach who used to work for Weird Tales, they would glaze, they would do like a grayscale or something, and then they would glaze color on top of it which for me is great because I can't walk yeah. and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> so it's like, do picture, put on color, you know, <laughs> coloring book, you know? And so there's that. And uh, as a matter of fact, even that one that I showed you earlier, the creature thing, yeah. uh, uh, Julie, Julie Adams, uh, 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 what do you call those clam digger pants? I forget what they call them. It, it, I mean, uh, it was like, that ain't the right color. It's, it's not what I see in my mind's eye. So I painted it all uh, grayscale and then I just glazed over the color I thought the off tan that the exact one I get really anal <laughs> sometimes <laughs> about stuff and I just lock onto and I can't let go and um, even with the digital stuff too though sometimes I just go berserk uh, I did a 1951 cover for the thing for uh, We Belong Dead magazine uh, this new poster I just did that's going on the cover of uh, Rocco Jerome's Ghost Agents comics uh, that was a month and a week and that was digital. And wow. when people go, well, it's digital. It wasn't that hard. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of work. It was as much work as some people put into full blown, uh, it is a lot of detail. And I threw the kitchen sink at it because Metropolis is to oh, me that. great, great movies. And, uh, so it's, a I, I, it's a beautiful, I saw you post posted it on Facebook and I was, was blown away by it. It was, it was, that's, that's what five weeks day in and day out. I think, I think there was only uh, two days in that whole month and a week that I had off from it. Wow. I mean, it really, and it might, and then the, and the design might've even started before that, but I was like, but I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with what I did. I, I breathe a sigh of relief and I go away from it for a while. And then I go back and look and I go, 
uh, yeah, okay, that's good. I'm an audience member now. I'm no longer the artist. I'm somebody who got away from it's now looking at it, you know. So, so when you do when you do it digitally, do you like do you illustrate it by hand first and then like scan it and then paint it in the program or is it it's um it, it, I I use uh uh just I almost start off like cartooning in a way. Mm -hmm. I, I block everything and get my composition right. And gotcha. then it depends uh like with um with that one, I actually had a couple of models pose because I wanted oh, a, wow. a pose the exact way. Yeah. Here's a here's an interesting, a little interesting aside. 35 years ago, I started a, um, I don't know if you see in the poster, but you see Frieder, the hero of the movie, pointing with his mm -hmm. hand like that, you know. 35 years ago, I was doing that exact image in colored pencil. I just love that image where he's yeah. pointing, going, you're not the real Maria. Yeah. And so I go out in the backyard. My dad's out there raking up the leaves or something like that. And I go, Dad, I need a guy's arm because <laughs> in the movie, it's all in the shadow and I can't see the 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 anatomy very well the fingers and the knuckles so i had this 30 uh, the, or a polaroid of my dad with well, he got a goofy smile on his face but he's pointing uh -huh. and i did this thing and it's very very minimal but it's and i still got it upstairs this colored pencil yeah. version of freighter pointing like that 35 years later i'm doing this poster i said i've got to get that image in this large poster my son posed for it this time oh cool so, you know That's and so it's like cool. and he, yeah. he put on the white shirt and everything and the tie and all that kind of stuff because while the movie had a great shot of him doing that it it just it didn't work in a still image as well as what i wanted what i wanted yeah and yeah. so you know I mean, uh -huh. I'm always doing that photograph and people photograph in my own hands and they're looking at my hand going like this. People going, what's wrong with this guy? You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but uh, there's a lot of that. And uh, then I, I go in and I'll usually uh, it depends on whether you, you've got somebody you're giving a piece of artwork to where they um, expect some roughs. That's different you send them they don't like it or they want some changes or they don't and if they do you 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 restructure based on what you guys talked about and then you just get serious i i work in in the digital realm i work do most of the heavy lifting in a program called corel painter which you can get it to act like watercolor and you can get it to act like woodcut you can get it to act like oil and all that stuff and i usually do it in the oil mode but i've kind of built my own brushes the way i like them say feel sort of and it, and in a way it's kind of funny because even with doing a digital i found that it, it helps me in the real world painting sort of like even though it's digital like i said there's still the same effect and the way the brush lays the paint down and if it's partially transparent the way real paint is and you got to coat it two or three times to get it to do it it's almost like you then go over to real painting you go oh okay so, you know no 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 problem it's i'm kind of already there mentally but um anyway so uh and then you know you uh it, it depends too. Some 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 are fairly easy. I, I don't know if you remember that painting I did of the Gorgon from the Hammer yes. film. Oh, I love that painting. Yes. That was fast. That mm -hmm. was super fast. I did that one in like five days. That was pretty mm -hmm. quick. Uh at the time my then wife posed for me with the oh cool <laughs> with the hands because the hands in the photo were, were in shadow and I was like, oh it's not it's not it, it there's a, such a big difference between a, a a painted image and a motion picture image. People think mm -hmm. they see things in film. Later, you go back and look at this. Oh, it wasn't exactly the way my mind r romanced it up. Yeah. So I try to put some of that back in for a still image. Anyway. Nice. So you're taking you were taking the existing image and then infusing it with what you wanted to see in there and what yeah, you infusing remember. More. And I even remember something simple, like I wrestled with the idea of, remember, there's that gold chair that she sits in that's up on that rise. And I, I'm like, just an empty chair sitting up there. People aren't going to, it's not going to make any sense, but I, I dropped it in there and left it very, very painterly. I was like, yeah. you know, just, uh, and everything. And, uh, and it's, it's very popular. I mean, yeah. it, you know, the print sells very well, but I just, it was yeah. easy and it was fun and it's, uh one of those where the chair glowing in the background really adds to it for some reason. So I lucked out. The two framed uh, pieces of artwork I have prints of artwork are yours, uh, Barnabas Quentin and Angelique and Basil Gogos. Yeah, right. it is, those are the two I haven't framed in my Dark Shadows collection. Was Basil Gogos an influence on you at all? Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's it's pretty easy for me. It's like a, a frog leaping from lily pad to lily pad. For me, it was um, oddly enough for, first Doctor Seuss. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then I saw little art books in the air base at Ramstein Air Base in Germany, pen and ink. I saw like a telephone drawn with pen and ink. Yeah. I was like, you take a whole bunch of lines and it forms a telephone sitting on top of a table. How do they do that? How do they? <laughs> And it just drove me crazy. And that was in the 60s. But then, um, like I said, I got into Kirby, Jack Kirby. Then I jumped over to uh, James Bama, or as I think uh, oh, yeah, the Aurora uh, Bill, Stout, Bill Stout was telling me. It's actually pronounced Bama, but um, it, it, that the, the monster box art, but also uh, the Doc Savage book covers. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I thought were just amazing. Once again, talking about something that looks like a photograph. Yeah. And uh, he does glazing too, by the way. There's glazing over. He would, he, you know, with those paintings as well. But they're just so beautiful. And then, with famous monsters, I got into uh, Basil Gogos. I met him one time, and yeah. I had done uh, uh, Vincent Price from the movie Madhouse. I recreated it with like magic markers. And he goes, "Hey, you sound like an illustrator." And I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> Pretty much, but I mean, I love his covers. I loved uh, uh, Ken Kelly's covers. We've got some oh, of yeah. the, some of the famous monsters posters that you could get back in the day or in in the living room, oh, and cool. uh, <laughs> they've got um, you know the Ken Kelly uh, the uh, what is it 1975 convention poster. Oh yeah, and, yeah, and and stuff like that. But uh, I I I do know who owns not only that that piece of artwork, but the one that you've got the original, the Barnabas back there behind your head. I, oh I, really? Yeah, yeah. So, but I won't I won't say that because that's kind of okay. not no not no the don't say thing it don't say world. it on camera. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's just uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go over to their place here in the near future and just pour over them. I'm gonna, I said, wow. look, I got to put up a sheet behind me so no light bounces off the glass in the frame, and I'm going to sit there and take four thousand photographs of every <laughs> brush stroke because I can learn. You look at a painting really, really close up, and it's like they leave evidence on how they did what they did, and you learn that way. So. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. So you got, uh, you did the uh, Dark Shadows lunchbox, which has to be, you know, in addition to the coffin box, that has to be the coolest piece of Dark Shadows merchandise that has come out in recent years. Um. And I would, that way. yeah, it's all, oh, it's, I love, I well, I love your artwork on it. Um. You know, you, you did all kinds of really cool stuff. Now look at the werewolf. Look at the werewolf. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's me. Oh, you're you're posing for for the That's Chris me. Jennings werewolf. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Awesome. I yeah, love yeah. it. <laughs> I mean, it's okay. I mean, it was like I was thinner then, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, um, everyone's going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was. It was. I. I. You know, it's funny to me. This is so how. Cool. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of fun doing that. <laughs> um, it's amazing to me what a good looking werewolf that is for a soap opera. Dark shadows, budget wise. Daytime TV budget, you know, didn't compare to a, a primetime show, but Dark, Dark Shadows had compared to other daytime soap operas had a decent budget. But even that, you know, they had to really stretch that to make to do the effect and all, all the things they did. But the yeah. werewolf, Vinny Lascalzo's makeup on Alex Stevens was fantastic. And he was such a great werewolf, too. He was very dynamic. He was a stuntman. So he did all kinds of jumping off the balcony and all kind of. Yeah. It looked good. It looked good. Yeah. It's not my. That's not my last werewolf piece. I'll be doing others in the future. But cool. I um, it's amazing to me how good that is. And I'm going to be a little, little mean spirited here and talk about you know, uh, werewolves are great. Oliver Reed's werewolf is great. The mm -hmm. the uh, Cheney Jr. I I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Werewolf of London's makeup, even though it's more devilish. Mm -hmm. I'm even a fan of Jack Nicholson and Wolf. I, yeah. Because Jack Nicholson doesn't need that much werewolf. Uh, true. Good point. Werewolf. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just just put a toupee on him and you're almost there. <laughs> but I, it amazes me how good the werewolf looked on on um, Dark Shadows, and yet the werewolf on a show that I I love and I love the movies, the Night Stalker. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Was one of the worst, and it's almost like I couldn't believe it's like they shoved a triple. <laughs> on top of a stunt man's head i was gonna say he yeah. stick his head up the triple's backside but it was like and then just pulled it over and, ah, and it does all this surprising. cute little it looks like a big triple it's yeah. and, and yeah. then it's like how the heck could they do that on that soap opera where they're 
they Dark Shadows was like the equivalent in television as to what surgery was on MASH. It was <laughs> meatball surgery television. Yeah. Two yep. to two and a half hours a week. Yeah. A brand new play every every week for how many years? Five, five and a half, years. Something? Almost almost five, five years. Yeah. And then two films. But yeah. but I'm like looking at going like people go oh all the all the mistakes that they made and the stuttering and because the, it's like it's a miracle how good that show it's was. like live theater i mean and it's and they were cranking like you said they were cranking five of those out every week and learning a new script and doing special effects and on like these epic storylines you know uh it's I can't, when I, people make fun of the bloopers, I'm like, you try, try doing that and see, see how you do. You know? It's incredible. Yeah. Um, if, and that, that, it made me wonder sometimes if, and I know they, I don't know if they did this or not, but was the werewolf shot? Did they try to do more filming of him so that they didn't have to kick? Cause that makeup looked complex. That wasn't a, a you know, a 30 minute werewolf job. It looked like, yeah. Like, you know, did they film ec- the extra scenes for three or four episodes so that they could then, you know, take it off and then, okay, Monday, we'll put the makeup back on you and you'll do some more. Uh, but, you know, the way that it seems like they talk about it, it's like, okay, Dark Shadows, this episode, psh, okay, let's go. And then yeah. they just start filming. But I always wondered if they if they might have, with the, with, with the case with that werewolf, they might have filmed, okay, we'll jump up two days ahead on filming his scene with this or something to, to get it in there. I don't know. Maybe, maybe so. Maybe so. I know he would come in early. Um, because you know David Selby was and uh, Don Briscoe were both werewolves in the show, right. but Alex Steven played Alex Stevens played the werewolf when they would transform. So he would come in very early to get his makeup started, from what I understand. But I'm not sure if they would film specific scenes with him and save them for later or just do them all in a row i'm pretty sure he would just come in earlier and vinnie lascalzo you know would put his put his makeup on uh great job. They yeah great job. Uh, yeah. just incredible and he was a, he was a big long cheney jr fan too he was um gosh he was in one of those shows um what's my line i think it was what's my line and um you know he took the makeup off right on camera on the show. It's on YouTube and it's on the, the coffin box set and the extra features. Uh, yeah. And he talks about how he's a big fan of Lon Chaney Jr. And, uh, sure. uh, and it was, it was really cool. So you did now the lunchbox. I know you also, this image of the, of the terrible trio here of. Uh, yeah. That's a redoing of the, of the cover for scream magazine. I was going to ask. So did the scream magazine cover come first yes. before? And you did one with Johnny Depp too you did the johnny depp i did the johnny depp one and i did that one uh at the same time one was released to the um to the major bookstores i think the johnny depp one because it was the big news at the time and then that the one that you're showing is the one that was released to the comic shops and stuff like that the specialty shops so how did the lunchbox come about then from from scream magazine oh i heard from um jim pearson jim pearson thank you yeah and he asked me about uh, about doing it. Uh, I, I, I don't remember the specifics now, but we talked to this lunchbox. I said, heck yeah, it's a cool lunchbox. <laughs> and uh, and we worked out the payment and that included the box set. Uh, the, and I was very happy about that. And uh, and then we talked about extra what would we'll go on the other sides. And it was sort of like. Oh, you know, Angelique's already on the front, so we need to put her and Maggie. We're gonna do Maggie in a costume. You know, it was all that kind of just figuring stuff out. And um, uh, you know, I mean, to me, really, uh, you know, in some way, I would have liked to have worked in, you know, Doctor Hoffman. And you people uh, have asked about that. They were like, "Where? Why wasn't Julia on the lunchbox?" But but it's like, I mean, it would have been. I could see if you kind of did. I mean, it would have been because you. It's nice composition with these three here, which yeah. is why Eric did that for my logo too. He has the three, and a lot of right. people have also asked me like, "Oh, why isn't Julia on there?" I'd love to have find a way to to do that, but maybe we could rearrange. Julia them. Hoffman, Julia Hoffman, and um, I got to tell you, one of the people that I really love on the show, uh, and I I don't I didn't think anything of him when I was a kid. I it was like, okay, who's that guy? Let's get on to the next. Let's where's a monster? <laughs> was Roger? 
Oh, I Roger, Roger was great. Collins. He yeah, was so he was good. I mean, I love that snotty voice of his. <laughs> yes. Whether he was being <laughs> a good brandy. guy or a bad guy or a confused guy or whatever. And I'm like, you know, when I grow up, I want to be just like Roger Collins. That's who I want. <laughs> you know uh and and uh something really, to aspire to i <laughs> liked him a lot yes and i love julia hoffman i thought mm -hmm. she was a great character uh so yeah it wasn't i don't even know if it was anything of okay who has to go on there i think it was sort of the basics of when you see an old 1960s lunchbox you know they're gonna i mean it's like um the Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea lunchbox doesn't have Kowalski on there, you know, yeah, yeah, right, or it right. doesn't have the chief. It's got Richard Basehart and David Hedison and then some monsters and submarine and the flying sub. And it's like something's got to give. Now, did you paint this in um, – was this digital or was this done in oils or acrylics? No, or? Digital, digital. It was all digital. Of them, all of them okay. were digital. Yeah. All of them were digital, yeah. The first one was um, – but of course, like I said, was the, the trio one. Mm -hmm. And um, – I was, I, I had to have it, I had to have it feel like the show. Mm -hmm. I had to have it, even in the coloring, I had to have that sort of champagne sort of green that I, yes. I, 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 I know that a lot of times they photographed it and it was blue when they would do that. Doo -doo, yeah. What you did here too. Like that one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But on the other one, I was like, I want you with that color to be able to smell the salt air. Oh, I love it. I and love that's that. why I yeah. did the greenish tint. And then yeah. I did them in, in tints of green as well. As a matter of fact, right after that got done, I met Laura Parker, who, by the way, as we know, the yes. horrible, yeah. horrible Heart thing this week. Yes, I'm very sad about it. And it was like, and it was kind of funny meeting her. It was the same thing as meeting Mark Goddard, who also passed away yes. last week. Yeah. And that is, they both were so good at being, kind of either confrontational or angry or whatever like he was always mad at dr smith she was always getting ready to put a curse on somebody that when i felt that i met them i thought i wasn't going to like them mm -hmm. right which is strange and i loved both of them they were both wonderful as you know and i but i brought her a copy of that magazine and, and i said this is you know it's in, and you're on here and all this kind of stuff she goes oh no come and sit at the table and i said uh -huh. she was very very sweet and i said like, well that's exactly the opposite of angelique that is absolutely yeah. 100 and a very very nice lady and the same thing yeah. with mark goddard he was a sweetheart very nice yeah. but just good acting yeah just good acting but her with her crystal eyes that stare yeah, I mean, incredibly beautiful, but but at the same time, just I, I don't even know how to describe her face. It, it's almost like it's it's almost like when you see Paul Newman or something. It's almost like the face is just almost too perfect. Right, you know? right, yeah. yeah. And and you captured her expression perfectly. Just that, you know, she's she's beautiful, but she's like vengeful. There's like a crazed kind yeah, of a quality. Some there's going to be some trouble. Yeah. And Barnabas, the snarl, you got it. And Quentin, you know, with the full moon right behind him. It's just perfect. It's just dead on. Did you ever get, have you, how did you get to show? Well, first of all, did Lara, how did Lara react to the, to the painting? Oh, she absolutely loved it. I gave oh, her the good. magazine and that's why she, I didn't have time. I had to get back to my own table, but yeah. she was like, no, no, stay and visit and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, yeah. uh, they were very nice. Her and, um, Oh my gosh, Catherine, no. Catherine, Catherine. Scott. yeah, they were, they were very, very, did very she, nice. did Catherine like the Josette on the side here? Oh, I never saw that. I never, that, that okay. was done after I met them. That I was see. only the magazine. So yeah. Okay. And that was another thing too, doing the, doing the cover, uh, doing mm -hmm. the original cover. It was like, okay, who, who goes on here? Yeah. And it was like, well, it is a monster magazine. So are we going to get people like Catherine Lee Scott on there who, yes, did do some metaphysical stuff. And then you got that one thing as, as <laughs> a famous monster described that a giant fried egg for an eye. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, what are you going to put on there? And it was like, we talked about it and finally, I wanted to get a werewolf on there so bad. And mm -hmm. it was like, I couldn't go on there. It just got too busy. And yeah. so it's like, get, give, give them the three head honchos, give them the three big gunslingers. Yeah. And you know, nobody's going to be happy. I'm not happy. I'd love to have had more on there. I'd love to have had more on the lunchbox too. I think right. one side of it's just some tombstones out in front of the old house. It, it is, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Uh, out but the that, top. that's yeah, that's a mechanism. There's no way. Yeah, yeah Julia, Julia Hoffman right in the middle of that would be sad. Yeah. And yeah. then the old house, right? right. Yeah, yeah. It's um, been so long, I forgot what was on the bottom. <laughs> it, yes, the old the old house. Yeah, it looks really cool. Um, 
I wish the only thing I wish is that it had come with a with a thermos. Uh, that, yeah, that was, yeah, I'm so I'm surprised they never made one of these in the '60s because uh, all the other merchandise, much of which I have quite a bit behind me here, but you I'm got the I'm game. I wanted that the, game so the, bad. Oh, the Barnabas kid. Collins game. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever see the commercial? I mean, you oh win, yes. You yeah. wear the fangs, and the kid like, puts the fangs, and it's, it's so so sanitary. Every time you win, you just give the fangs to the next the person, the next kid. <laughs> Nice. Don't, mind, don't mind that sore on my lip right <laughs> but yeah i mean i i i had the uh the barnabas uh model kit mm -hmm. and i i built it and put it up it was a glow in the dark one and i had it and i'll never forget it was the weirdest thing i was laying on my bed in the middle of the day, i had a headache and it was like a uh, picnic family family's having a picnic out in the backyard yeah. and i went and laid down and took some mm -hmm. aspirin and, a, and the window was open and the barnabas thing was up on a on a shelf and a gust of wind like a rocket came through, hit it, and then threw it to the floor. It was like wow. the weirdest thing. It's like, I just couldn't believe what happened. I just sat there and watched it shatter, and I was oh crying. God. Oh, no. Anyway, but oh. uh, it was one of those things where you just sort of, hey, your monsters matter to you. you know? yeah, yeah, totally. Um, speaking of things that matter, you have a piece in here in written, and you also have, did the cover of Running Home to Shadows. Uh, yes which is really a wonderful, uh, wonderful book, but I love, love your cover for this. And you did get the werewolf in there in the back, which, which is really cool. I love the mist and the fact that they're all in, in shadow there, but we know exactly they, they had who to they be. are. I think that's part yeah. of that. Um, uh, this is a, a written, this is not news informational stuff. If yeah. it was informational about, okay, here's the history of the dark shadows television show. I could actually, have the actors i think on there if i'm not mistaken i believe it's so like a, like a fair sort of, use thing but this is sort of like this is more of a reminiscence and prose you know kind of a thing and i don't think that allows the same thing i've done it with some star trek books and some doctor who books too mm -hmm. where you try to you you try to do things that are star trek-esque doctor who-esque dark shadow-esque and um but uh, yeah, Jim Beard did that as a, uh, a a kind of a love letter to his uh, dearly departed wife. Yeah. She loved the show, and he was hurting, and and I think he used it as uh, you know catharsis, you know, as a, a yeah. kind of a therapy to to get it out. And I I you know I applaud him for doing it, and I'm very glad that he had me do the cover. And it's her. Um, uh, he he said that's meant to be her there yeah, watching her. watching dark shadows with her plate of uh, cookies there. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and I think Kool Aid or something like that. Yeah. I don't know what it was, but that's that's the way kids were. You get home and yeah. well, at least and if you were in the right time zone. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. So so when you left, it was was it what do you remember which storyline you were in like. Oh, no. The last mm -hmm. thing I saw physically of Dark Shadows was a floating hand with a pair of scissors going after Quentin. Oh, so I think, it's, or it's something like that. the hand of Comfortofi. Yeah. 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 And I'm and I'm sort of like, and you know what? You're going to kill me. I, I still <laughs> haven't. I mean, I'm, I'm still in the first season. OK. OK. But what I do is I watch like, you know, about a month's worth. And then I put it away and then I bring yeah. it out again. And I'll probably even start it again today because it's comfort food, but yeah. I'm going to keep going. And I, but the the rest of the times where they showed it on channel 17 and they showed it on all these different services and the videos, I've, it's been all over the place. It's been hodgepodge with me seeing a little bit of Count Patofi, see, you know, just, and I'm like, what's this, what's this HP Lovecraft thing? I mean, I don't yeah. even, and I'm sort of like, so I've got a ways to go, but, um, but my love is there for it. I just, in a way, I'm kind of glad I haven't, I haven't seen it all yet, you know? Yeah. You have something you know, to look forward to. Yeah, for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, I try to explain it to people. Uh, you know, I, I had a couple of younger friends of mine say, you know, I tried to watch that dark shadows and it's like, yeah, it's just, uh, that was not good at all. And I'm like, you just, huh. you're not, you're not looking at it like an art historian. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most people, most people look at the Mona Lisa and they go, eh, "There's just a lady there with her hands." Because it's, like, <laughs> it's like this first portrait of just like a regular person. Yeah, it's like it's not it's not hired by the church or anything. It's just this lady. We don't know who she is, and it's incredibly beautifully rendered. And it's just a human for being a human. Yeah, and and that stuff matters. And dark shadows matters. It proves you could do something that I would have thought would have been impossible. Right. Like I so yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a massive fan. I love Jonathan Frid. Love everybody on the show. 
you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's great. Yeah. It's, it's unfortunate. I think some people have a difficult time kind of uh, looking at things within the proper context and putting themselves in that, in that kind of mindset, you know, you have to look beyond things like the bloopers and look at the heart of the thing, the writing and the acting and the, just the creativity that went into making that. And the fact that they're pulling like people, people who are fans of classic horror. I mean, that, it's just infused with all of that. Speaking of, we we were chit chatting a bit at um, Wonderfest about you were you were grilling me. You were asking me a bunch of questions at the, at the old dark clubhouse. So now it's my Bear turn. Your papers. Mark, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's my turn, Mark. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna just throw some questions out here. Okay. Um, Hammer or Universal? Look, lady. What what? Well, I said, look, lady, I've got, <laughs> <laughs> I've got to make a living off of some of the. Uh, okay, you know, okay. You know, no, no, uh, uni well, universal, universal. universal. Okay. Yeah, I mean that's not even much of a that's not even much of a stretch. I, there's a lot of stuff in Hammer that I really love, but Universal was made by the Hollywood machine in full swing, mm -hmm. with inventive people coming over from different countries who had a lot of creativity in their heads, and they got good money backing. Mm -hmm. For a lot of that stuff, uh, Frankenstein, Dracula, Bride mm -hmm. of Frankenstein, The Black Cat, I think is a super oh, masterpiece. Yes. yes. Uh, you know, all those. And yeah, it gets it gets kind of, it gets B-filmish and some of those Lon Chaney mummy movies. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, it's okay. But um, but the, 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 the original one, Son of Frankenstein, which was later The Wolfman, uh, Werewolf of London, I just think those are amazing films with amazing mood. Mm -hmm. uh hammer it's got a lot of beautiful ones brides of dracula i think that's their that's my tip top favorite uh hammer film mm -hmm. um i also love uh, curse of the werewolf uh frankenstein must be destroyed uh jumping off the gothics to quatermass in the pit uh, a movie that made me mute for a whole day as i saw it when i was five years old and it was brand new mm -hmm. and uh when colonel breen melted i i lost my voice i couldn't talk my parents i came home and my parents were like what's wrong with you and uh, shock. <laughs> yeah which is funny because decades later i took took my then time at the time girlfriend and her mom to see indiana jones and the last crusade and the same actor julian glover drinks from the wrong cup and starts to rot and then her mom loses it and i'm like jesus so i finally meet him a couple of years ago at pensacon and i go you look you know this is this thing you keep doing you keep rotting and falling apart and he went and picked his wine up off the bar and he goes, and yet I'm still here. And then he walks off and I'm like, what the, what the hell is that supposed to, what does that even mean? I don't even know what that means, but it was like, I wasn't going to get a straight answer out of him. But, <laughs> but now Quatermass in the pit to me is a, is a, is a masterpiece, low budget, a few flaws in the special effects, but amazing film. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I do love hammer tremendously though. I mean, yeah. but uh, universals, the cat's pajamas that actually, actually hammers kind of third. I, I do those German, the German films, like, Oh, really? the German expression, like the not, Nosferatu. Well, Nosferatu and, and, uh, and Metropolis, not that it's expressionist, but you Cabinet know of I mean? Dr. Caligari, Caligari and the mm -hmm. golem and all that kind of stuff, yeah. because those people were winging it. Yeah. Oh, totally. That's all great stuff. I love, love those films too. Um, I would, I, I'm going to agree with you too, with Universal. I, somebody asked me this question recently on another podcast and I was like, oh, you're killing me with this question, but I adore Hammer, but I have to go with Universal. I mean, I, they're so iconic. Um, and, and I also, of course, love those German silent films as well. Um, just wonderful stuff. All right. So what about Lugosi versus Lee? Who? Who do you pick? I, Lugosi. Lugosi, yeah. That's not even a no contest. I think I think that I think that Lugosi did something. Lee was incredible at doing the feral yes. Dracula, but I think he would admit this if he were still with us. I, he kind of did in a way. He didn't like playing Dracula because he didn't yeah. have any personality and he didn't have any lines and he and all that kind of stuff. And Lugosi got to be uh got to manipulate maneuver that's why in some ways i actually prefer david peel over christopher lee because in brides of dracula he has to maneuver and manipulate and he yeah. talks that woman into letting him go and as soon as he gets gets himself unchained he's like come here mother you know and it's like oh <laughs> yeah. maybe this guy isn't so nice ever. Mm -hmm. i mean uh but i feel bad for lee because he is a great actor uh but I think uh, I, I agree with his assessment of it. Although I still absolutely love uh, uh, the the first one, 
mm-hmm. uh, what we call Horror of Dracula here, Dracula 57, 58, I can't remember. And then, and then uh, uh, Dracula has risen from the grave. Oh, I absolutely that's a love, great movie. I love yeah. that movie. Yeah. I love it. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Lugosi to me is, if you did a rubber stamp of like the silhouette, it would, that Lugosi would be more recognizable. It's almost like Frankenstein with the flat head. Yeah, it's like right. if you see a, a person's head and then it's flat on the top of well, this Frankenstein, you see Lugosi with his. It's just it's become ridiculously um, uh, copied, mimicked. Uh, it's an archetype. I mean, it's become yeah. archetypal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely, absolutely. It's like the it's like you know the Statue of Liberty. You know what it is when you see it. Totally. Yeah. And yet, there's been a lot of other people that have done the been in the Christopher Lee mode. Um, uh, I mean, I but that, that's a lot of guys I love that play Dracula. I love uh, um, uh, uh, I love Franklin Jell's Dracula. Yeah. I love uh, uh, oh goodness, what's the what's the video one that came out in the late seventy? Louis Jordan. Oh yeah, yeah. Dracula. Yeah. I like that one too. And and yeah, I do like the Gary Oldman Dracula. Although some people mm-hmm. get mad about it. I don't know why. There's some people either love it or you hate it. And I'm sort of like, well, there's things about it I really love. But uh, but for me, Lugosi's Dracula. I watch. It's Dracula is probably my second or third most watched film ever. Okay. I, I watch it almost at least a couple of times a year. What are one and two? Uh, I don't know what two would be, but number one is the 1951 version of The Thing. Oh, The Thing. Okay, cool. Which is crazy. Yeah. I just it, play, it plays like a – it's like, you know, when we, when we mm-hmm. were kids and Sgt. Pepper was the big album. I mean, it's <laughs> like you just played it over and over. It didn't leave the turntable. For you. That's the way I am sometimes with that film. Oh, that movie's over. Well, hit the play button again. Yeah. Something about the dialogue and the interaction between people is just so good. Yeah. But um, The Black Cat, I've seen so many times. Oh, yeah, yeah. Favorite favorite version of Jekyll and Hyde. But I think we talked about this at Wonderfest. But I would, oh yeah, yeah, so you already know it. We can talk about it in front of the the audience Dan, here. <laughs> Dan, well, back to back to Dan Curtis. You know, yeah. I I I do really love. Uh, I, I actually like Spencer Tracy's a lot. Mm-hmm. I do like um, Frederick March's a lot too. My only problem with that is he's a little too feral for me. Like it's sort of like. Uh, you know it's like he needs a tin cup and an organ grinder or something almost in some (laughs) scenes still really good but back then too you know that was when things were sort of uh uh, sound was new and Mm -hmm. so overacting was still or or i don't want to say overacting but expounding getting it out there Mm -hmm. was more i mean uh so that but the jack plants um one at least at this point is my is my favorite one there's something about it i just love the i love the look of the video and the and the sets that they built and uh when i watch jack palance and that i've seen him too many times be bad guys and too many times be whatever uh, gray area people and and in this one he is so believable as both a good guy and a bad guy yeah uh, and and it doesn't seem like Jack Palance. Neither one of those seemed like anything I'd ever seen him do. There was nothing where, mm-hmm. where um, I don't know. It, it was it, he really did put his heart into it. I think I know it was originally supposed to be Jason Robards, but for some reason he right. couldn't, couldn't do it. But uh, which would yeah. have been interesting too. It would have been interesting, yeah. But I mean, Jack, he was fantastic in that. That's one I think that used to get more credit, but I think it's kind of fallen off. The radar a bit i think more people definitely need to watch hyde was shorter in the, in the stevenson yeah, novella, yeah, yeah. But, was more- but just that sort of like no um inhibitions at all is really really just mean vicious hyde but enjoying every minute of it he really was loved being evil <laughs> and uh, yeah there's his... stuff with him as a kid uh running over the kid yes that's in the that's in stevenson's novella and that, there's a picture of frederick march stepping on the kid too yeah but they never i think that was cut from the film or i don't know if it was just a publicity shot but i, I suspect it was cut from the film because i think it was the little girl you see at the beginning of yeah. the of the frederick march film um in I think he tramples her, but it's a, it's a, there's a publicity shot of that. I think, I think one of the reasons that it's tough to, for this one to get the audience is because it's, it's old, you know, whatever, I don't know if it's 70 DVD, it's old videotape, it's NTSC or whatever it is. And there's a lot of people that one wouldn't sit through it too. I mean, the way that I saw it, the, I mean, I've got a DVD of it now, Mm -hmm. but um, it was an Elvira 
copy of it that I was like, oh, I yes, rented yeah. it, you know, yeah. I was like, I gotta, I gotta see this thing again. And, uh, now I do know that, uh, there's ways that they kind of, uh, add extra pixels or like they do with those doctor who, mm-hmm. uh, shows, if they could do that and maybe give it a little bit more clarity or more information. So it played better on a big TV set, that would be good. But, um, I, I still think it's a great one. And like what the Louis Jordan Dracula, that's on videotape too, or at least parts of it are. It looks like a Doctor Who episode. Did you ever see the did you ever see the invisible uh, invisible man one that the that the BBC guys did too? It was weird. No, had, I never saw that. Had the whole scene with the guy running down the 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 path through oh. the forest order with the axe chasing him and all that kind of stuff. And it was I think it was done by the guys that did Doctor Who, but that was kind of cool too. Some of the videotape actually works with me with horror. Yeah. And, and and I think that's the thing with the dark shadows too. You know, totally. Yeah, I, I I shot on video does bother me. I I I know some people can't kind of get into that, but it's like I don't know. I just because I guess because I grew up watching it, it doesn't. It immediately strikes me for horror films is like it has a kind of a gothic kind of I don't know why it's just kind of like a theater like gothic theater. That's like kind of the vibe I get from that, and it's. I'm totally fine with with the shot on video stuff. It would be interesting to see though what you describe, like if they process it and make it look more, I guess a little more film grain ish versus video. I wonder how that would look. Now with Blu-ray and stuff, the 4K and all this, like things are, you can see things in those shot on video uh, things that you wouldn't have seen on when they were broadcast on TV. Those TV movies and stuff. Um, it was like you know at the time you weren't going to see like for dark shadows like when you were watching it broadcast on tv in the 60s you weren't going to see the string pulling open the book but now when you watch it on like you know high def tv you can see you can see it but back then they weren't thinking we were going to have this kind of ability to see stuff in so much detail you know there's something about that too i mean people try to ask well what is it i mean the show seems to be so slow and it's like um but you know this is the times was that was the times we were in you know a lot of times it'd be uh either the kids were were coming home or if they weren't if they were in my time period in that time frame if they were in uh, central time or whatever uh there'd be the housewife and she'd be sitting there getting the you know thinking about dinner and maybe doing some iron and those shows i have actually watched some of it again and been painting or drawing while I'm watching it. And I I don't miss it. I don't miss a thing because there's usually one or two major revelations in a half hour. Yeah. And it's very much given to you. So I'm like, Oh, I get it. So I'm like when I'm drawing or painting and I'm watching, it's like, I'm like somebody doing the iron and go, or you're walking by with the lawn and you go, Oh, Oh, okay. Oh yeah. There's the, Oh, so he is a damned or what. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying. It's yeah, like no, it was you. like, yeah. and it's like, but it's almost reminds me of um, when there was drama strips in the in the newspaper on Sundays. You'd get yes. the whole thing, yep. but like you would have Dick Tracy even in the in the weekdays, and there'd be like three panels, and there'd be one more bit of information mm-hmm. to to yeah. move the the story forward. And you, every day you just get three yeah. more panels. Dark Shadows, you get thirty minutes, and they give you one or two one or two yeah. revelations you know but then as it goes on this is one of the theories about why dark shadows ended is like as it guilt goes on it gets more and more insane and stephen king mentioned this in dance macabre it's just like uh. just when you thought it couldn't get any more crazy it does and um they start adding a lot like every day is like a big cliffhanger kind of a thing so if you missed like a couple of days, wait, what, what, what's uh, parallel yeah. time? We're in parallel time. What's going on? Or what, why are we in the past? And there's a decapitated head that comes to life. Like what's what's going on? So they, they, the pace, I think, increased. The early episodes, the pace is very slow. I don't mind it. Some people don't like the slow pace of the early episodes. I like that slow burn. I like it. Yeah, I like it. I, I don't even mind Roger Collins' car getting messed with. Yeah, yeah. Know, I just don't <laughs> care. I think I think it's all cool. Uh, and that is interesting to hear that they speed up because and that'll be like so now it's going to make it more difficult for me to kind of paint while I'm watching. I mean, no, I got to put the tools down and yeah. watch this. I'll start watching it in the evenings with with dinner then and just yeah. be like, totally focused. Later on, it. on, it does like it starts to it's, they start to do more things in, in each episode. Like Curtis really wanted like every day to be like a Friday cliffhanger. Well, that's like, cool though. Like, that's yeah, cool. So Good for him. They started pushing more more of that. Um, 
is there any character or uh, you know horror sci-fi fantasy character or movie or show that you would love to paint that you have not had the opportunity yet to do we there's actually a lot now that you're asking me now i'm just like oh uh, i forgot about every one of them no there's oh. plenty, there's plenty and now i just can't i just now i can't think about them That's okay. um uh, I'm always in the, for things that I really love, I'll always do more too. That would be like dark shadows. Um, I haven't done really, uh, too much published as far as Star Trek goes a little bit in some British magazines and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm pretty lucky. I did the prisoner. I did the Steed and Peel Avengers. You know, I did voyage to the bottom of the sea. I did hammer. I've done some, you know, I've done, I think I've done most of the universal stuff mm -hmm. maybe there's still some more of that i do there's there's plenty of stuff and and the thing is too is i've had people ask me about specifics and what i like about it is it always seems when somebody asks you that eventually it becomes a reality yeah. so um I, i'll i'll give you a real obscure one uh i think it's roughly september 1966 giant starship going through the galaxy with an international crew riding wrongs. <laughs> now, what, what does that sound like? Hmm. Uh, Star Wars? No. <laughs> Ooh, <yeah. laughs> Go ahead and give me the answer. Star Trek, of course. Yes and no. Oh. There is a German television show, and I'm, I'm, I'm messing the name up, Rump, Rump Truil. It, it uh, Orion, it's a space patrol, and it was exact, almost the exact same kind of plot as Star Trek. No way! What it lasted for a half a season because I don't think science fiction was very popular in Germany at the time. But it's all in German. You can only see it right now, and I'm hoping someday somebody will come and not only restore it, bring it here to the United States, put subtitles underneath it. I'd like to do the cover for the for the box sets for that. Oh, but wow. it's um, but you can go to YouTube. Uh, and it's called, it's uh, R R A U M Truil. It almost sounds like it's French, Truil, T R O U I L L E, or something like that. And uh, Orion. And um, it's, 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 it's funny though. It's more kitschy, like, um, like it's mid, mid 60s. So it's almost like even a little bit more kitschy than Jerry Anderson's UFO. Okay. okay. But there's like scenes with them at the nightclub dancing and everybody's yeah. got their arms out to their sides and then they clap and then they all rotate to the other side. Yeah. And they've got <laughs> bouffant hairdos and, and everything. And a lot of people yelling at each other in German. It's amazing but, that that premiered the same year as Star Trek, like independently that they kind of came up with a similar premise wow it drives me crazy it was only like about four hours from where i lived at the time they were filming it oh wow but um <laughs> but the show uh it, it's like if you take the idea of star trek give it the kitsch of ufo and give it the budget of about like 1970s or 60s or 70s doctor who because they'll have like they, some of the sets are really nice but then they'll have like a control panel and there'll be like an iron like an a physical iron on the uh, amongst all the control buttons and it's like <laughs> that that's an iron that's, that's just so an weird. iron just sitting there and i guess maybe at the time it was considered such a new nobody's ever gonna recognize what that is and it's like now it's like you know right this is i think mrs cleaver left the iron there or something i don't know what happened but anyway if you get a chance check out some of the videos on youtube they, they got some of it's nice kitschy music too that's a lot of fun oh to i'll have to, to i'll have to check that out yeah i wasn't familiar right. with that that's wild yeah. i'd love have you ever painted um peter laurie or barbara Steele? Because uh, I'd love to see paintings of them from you. Yeah. Um, Peter Lorre. Have I done anything from Pete, with Peter Lorre? I don't think so. The closest thing to doing Barbara Steele, and I, oh, well, there's a cover of a DVD that I did called Monster Mania. And I think I did her okay. looking with the, she's got the holes in her face. Oh, the Black Sunday. Yeah. Black Sunday thing. And that, but it's tiny. It's like the DVD's this big and there's a whole bunch of monsters on it. And she's like, okay. like that big. And then, the other one was her only with her eyes sticking out of once again out of the Iron Maiden at the end of yeah. the Corman film, where oh. you just see her eyes. So yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. I have, but no, I'd like to do something more substantial. Speaking of Dark Shadows, yeah, um, yeah, you know, she was in that good. I actually did like the revival. Uh, my girlfriend Linda got me to watch it. She goes, "You got to yeah. see the show," because I didn't watch it because of the war. The oh, war the messed war. it up. Yeah, and so she goes, "Go ahead here," you know. Uh, let's watch all these things. I was like, 
that's pretty good. It's pretty pretty good show. I mean, it you know it was like it. For, yeah. force fed force fed the, uh, the 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 soap opera almost in a way. They were moving quick. Yeah, on they, that show. they compressed it. Yeah, yeah, they did. Sure. It, it didn't get enough of a chance. Like the Gulf War really derailed it with the preemptions, and you you experienced that firsthand. Like it's that on because the pilot did very well, and then the Gulf, Gulf War hit shortly thereafter, and it really screwed up the schedule. And it, it's unfortunate. And then NBC regretted canceling it too. Um, it, it's too bad because I I would wish that it had had more of a chance. So you painted the Johnny Depp Dark Shadows for Scream Magazine, which mm-hmm. is a, a great painting. What were your thoughts on the film? I don't think I asked you that at Wonderfest. I'm curious to hear what you think about that. Is this is this show is going? We're gonna people are gonna see the image, right? <laughs> oh, I'll put I'll put it up on the screen on the YouTube version of this. All right. Yes. Here's 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 my opinion. That's it. <laughs> That's it. That's my opinion. I Hopefully. I will say this, uh, and I agree with Tim Lucas on this. The first <clears throat> ten minutes had promise. I agreed. Doing totally the, agree. Doing yes. the doing the uh, Moody Blues thing and her coming in on the train and all that stuff. Yes, agree. Yep. And then uh, and I and I there's a lot of Tim Burton movies I really love. Same Sleepy Hollow. I, I would have Sleepy been Hollow is fantastic. I, yeah. I'm a big fan of the old Golden Age style of the first Batman movie. Oh, I love. We talked about that at a Monster Bat. I love. Yeah, it was good. Uh, it was. A, it's a wonderful. really, really great movie. As a matter of yeah. fact, I watched it again the other day, especially yeah. now that they got like a 4K level on streaming. Oh, yeah. Love 89 Batman. Yeah. But um, but uh, yeah, what a what a what a sad thing. I, I think I think Tim Bur- and, and and Ed Wood. Ed Wood's his mm-hmm. uh, it, probably for me his masterpiece. But oh, I love Ed Wood. But too. Yeah. um, I don't think uh, it was a. It I don't think it was a good thing to to make it into a comedy. Yeah, I just don't think it was yeah. a good thing. I I I, if it had been not Dark Shadows and it had just been Vampire Family, you mm-hmm. know, or something like that, maybe. Um, I know that Johnny Depp was very happy with the cover. Him and Tim Burton both got copies of the print of the of it, oh, and they cool. both they both really liked it. But yeah, did you yeah. hear from them? To, oh, you just heard word. Back. It was Warner Brothers was asking for, for me yeah. to. To, they said uh, this lady was a, I was talking with this lady and I thought she was talking about her kids she goes well I just want to because we really like this cover and Tim and Johnny both have won it want copies oh, okay. of it I said yeah. who are Tim and Johnny your your kids <laughs> that's what I thought she was talking about Tim and Johnny wanted it up on their walls of their room she goes no Tim Burton and Johnny Depp both yeah. <laughs> said they wanted yeah. a copy of it. I'm like, oh, okay. That's pretty that's pretty awesome. Um yeah, that that's I mean, great. It's... Yeah. That's you know, they they Tim Burton and Johnny Depp loved the original Dark Shadows for years. They said they loved the original Dark Shadows. They watched it as kids. Johnny Depp always said he wanted to play Barnabas. And it's like, why did you guys do that then? Why why do a, turn it into a comedy? Like I love, I agree. The first 10 minutes of the movie were promising and they're visually it looks like all Tim Burton movies it looks really cool like I'm glad that it was great they went to the effort to make Colin would look evocative of Seaview Terrace and stuff and they even gave Barnabas the bangs and stuff like they like in the show but it, sure. it's but it was cartoonish especially when Barnabas is in the present it turns into fish out of water comedy and it's that's a letdown um it, it was he, he was uh, so re- responsible for the great nightmare before christmas with oh, him and the animators and stuff yeah. but this was like he uh johnny depp got plucked out of that and dropped into the real world um i will say that i think eva green's a really good a- good actress too and uh especially on on penny dreadful the tv show i, oh, I liked her fantastic. in that i didn't like her as angelique but I, but I didn't like her as angelique but the one thing that showed promise is when she pulled up in the Omega Man's car with uh, oh yes <laughs> with the music playing that Chuck Heston played in the film and I was like oh my True. gosh it was a then, cool reference yeah <laughs> but the end by the end of the film I felt bad for everybody I I did not I I like the guy the actor himself but I did not like Roger Collins portrayal oh agree like, yeah Johnny Lee was it Johnny Lee? no but I that guy's a, that guy's a good actor he really yeah. is a really good actor and then uh and I felt bad for Michelle Pfeiffer you she know. and she was a fan too. She's a she's a Dark Shadows fan. Yeah. And she was a good choice to play Elizabeth. I don't completely blame Tim Burton and Johnny Depp. I think we do tend to kind of point at the director and the star and say, oh, why did you guys do that? Because they were championing the, the thing for years. Sure. But it's also Warner Brothers. Um, Warner Brothers told them from what I understand that they wanted it to be a comedy because there were too many other vampire, serious vampire things out during that time. So I think they pushed 
Warner Brothers pushed for a comedy, but Tim Burton and Johnny Depp are such a powerful combo in Hollywood. I would imagine they'd be able to push back a bit and say, no, we're not, we don't want to do it that way, but I don't know. I i don't know how that works, but it's, it's part of the, it's in the past. And you know, one yeah. thing I, I find out is that you can have all history books and stuff like that. And you mm-hmm. have cross referencing opinions. I've heard, I've heard stories about one thing and I've heard a completely different story from reputable sources saying different things. And I'm like, I don't think we'll ever completely know on so right. many films. And, and I think this is one yeah. of those um, to yeah. me, fingers crossed that we get some good dark shadows in the future. That's all. Yeah. I, that's all I'm hoping for. And and I really hope that if there is oh, was Mark B. Perry's, you know, really pushing this dark shadows reincarnation, which I, I hope he gets, cause I think he'll do it justice, but I hope that you're involved in some way. Like if there's a release DVD release or, or, or well, no, I say DVD, so blue Blu-ray, whatever, or, any merchandise like posters and things like that, I would love to see a Mark Maddox represent Mark Maddox represented uh his artwork in some form. Absolutely. Um, I appreciate it. I really do. Thank you. Uh, oh my goodness. It's I just love it. I great. love it. I'm a, I'm a fan. Yeah. And it's beyond, like I said, it's beyond some some artists that you find out they just did mm-hmm. the job. Uh yeah. not me. I take this stuff very seriously. As a matter of fact, I've had people try to have me. There's been a, only a few covers I've ever done that are comedic. Uh, mm-hmm. Like I did a robot monster looking, hold, trying to figure the remote while he's putting in a, a Santos movie or something <laughs> on a, on a cover, and that was done specifically yeah. as humor because robot monster is pretty humorous in a lot of ways. Sure. But but I've had times when people have asked me to 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 do funny stuff, and I'm like, no, I take these subjects very seriously. If the movie was serious, I want to do it serious. I want to pay homage to it, and and I want to. Um, it's almost like I want people to think. Hey, where'd you get this publicity photograph? I've never seen this one from this film before. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm like. I'm not. I'm not going to mess with it. And uh, with Dark Shadows, I take it very seriously. You know, so a, lot of, a lot of fun. So let's keep our fingers crossed that we get some good Dark Shadows in the near future. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Mark, can can you tell us a what you have coming up, and also where we can find your work? Okay, um, a new cover of Scream should be coming out in the next week or so. Um, I don't think I can even tell you what the cover is about, although uh, fairly famous for the fans of classic classic horror uh, with a few surprises in there. Um, and um, so I think I think Daryl's going to be taking that to Chiller, and then it goes out onto the stands, onto the new stands. Um, I've got uh, I'm doing some covers for. Um, a writer, uh, a, a character called the Red Menace, who basically is uh, early 19th century, kind of a throwback to the time period of like uh, the Destroyer and stuff. Remo Williams, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but yep. uh, doing that and uh, got Rocco Jerome's uh, cover for uh, Metropolis for the flip side of his comic, giant comic format comic, Ghost Agents which has got a Kickstarter going for that. Just um, uh, And um, Geez, um, I'm trying to think of what else. I know that I've got a whole bunch of stuff, but now that you're asking me, once again, it just you, flies right out of my head. You got a lot going on. I, I mean, yeah, you see, see your posts on uh, on Facebook and things that you're revealing and stuff. It's just a lot, a lot of cool things. Um, what about your? How can we find you online? Okay, uh, it's uh, Maddox Planet M A D D O X P L A N E T dot com. Uh, I've got. Um, uh, actually, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think the store is active too, which is something I've had Maddox Planet for, I don't know, 15 years, something like that, maybe even uh-huh. longer. I don't know. But I finally, uh, we we attached it into a store so you can buy stuff from there too. But uh, it's nice. a way to get a hold of me. Anybody ever have any commissions they want to do? And, you know, I do all kinds of things. I love all kinds of movies too. It isn't just horror films. I love, you know, Mm-hmm. it's so many movies that i'm a fan of and i have people do stuff that uh, you know some people have me hire me to do stuff that they'd be like oh i wouldn't realize you would have done that and it's like no i love movies a lot but i'll you know yeah i'll draw your dog i'll draw <laughs> i'll draw your favorite car you had as a kid i'll i'll do this that or the other oh, so uh, you take commissions from people oh absolutely yeah sure oh, awesome and uh you know i mean uh you know a few in you know, the last few years i mean somebody wanted a p- portrait of albert finney you know and i'm like huh. okay sure <laughs> you know um but just stuff like that so yeah yeah but cool very cool and are you doing any convention appearances coming up um i think luckily for me i think i'm going to get the next 
two to three months off from it because nice. I just finished my last one down in Bartow, Florida, which went well. And then this, then it starts back up. There'll okay. be uh Pensacon is the, one of the big ones I do down here, which is nice. It's only three hours away. Oh, good. And a yeah. uh, lot of, a lot of, a lot of love there for, uh, for uh, science fiction, fantasy and horror there too. So great. Cool. Fantastic. Well, everyone have a wonderful Halloween. Hopefully my plan is to get this episode up for Halloween. So we, this, I want this to be my oh. Halloween episode. So finger, oh, finger and there's nobody it. I'd rather have in my yeah. Halloween episode than Mark. So Mark, thank you. thank you for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure getting to to chat with you and, and hear about your experiences, not only with Dark Shadows, but with your artwork and being a monster kid growing up and, and all of this really cool stuff. So it's been a pleasure and I really look forward to the next time we get to get to hang out. So oh, I, I hope so. I hope we get to talk again and yell. Oh, yeah. a, AKA Penny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I really, I really appreciate you having me on here. I'm a big fan and uh, you know, I mean, I think we've got some of the same DNA. I really do. Yeah. <laughs> I, so, think so. well, I think so. I think so. We were like, just like, <laughs> ping, ping, ping ponging back and forth <laughs> in, in the old dog clubhouse it was it was a lot of fun and yeah. um i remember somebody came and sat went to come and sit down next to us and we were just like <laughs> we sounded like xanti misfits off outer limits <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> that was so much fun but thank you very much for listening and uh, have a happy halloween and for as long as they lived, the dark shadows never truly vanished, for there will always be Terror at Collinwood. Terror at Collinwood is a Penny Dreadful production. <laughs>